Isabel, The Straits of Florida, Somewhere North of Cuba, 1994, One Day from Home. The tanker emerged from the darkness like some giant leviathan come to swallow them. It stood at least seven stories tall out of the water and was so wide it filled the horizon. Its pointed bow sent huge waves sluicing away and two massive anchors stood out from the slides like the horns on a monster. Isabel quelled in fear. It was straight out of a nightmare. A ship, Lido yelled. We've drifted into the shipping lanes. By now, everyone had seen it. The rumble of the ship's massive engines had awakened Mahmi and Senor, Senora Castillo, and everyone was scrambling around in the boat in a panic, making it rock dangerously. It's coming right for us, Amaro screamed. Isabel climbed over Ivan, trying to get as far away from the tanker as she could. She slipped and fell with a splash into the bottom of the boat. Everybody settle down, Senora Castillo cried, but no one was listening. We have to get the engine started, Papi cried. He yanked frantically on the starter chain, barely giving the engine time to cough and die before he yanked on it again. Don't! You'll flood it and it'll never start, Louis said, trying to wrestle the chains from him. Where are the matches? Lido cried. We have to start a fire. They can't see us in the dark. Here, said Ivan. He lifted a matchbox from the styrofoam carton that held the few emergency supplies they had brought. No, Boppy yelled. He lunged for Ivan's outstretched hand, and together they fell against the side of the boat, tipping it. Isabel's mother fell into the pool of water on the bottom and slid into the side of the boat with a thump. Isabel crawled to help her. Lido grabbed Poppy by the shirt. What are you doing? he demanded. Poppy held the matchbox out of Lido's reach. We don't want to be seen, you fool! He yelled over the growing thunder of the tanker. If they see us, they'll have to rescue us. It's maritime law. And if they rescue us, they'll send us back to Cuba. Would you rather they send us to the ocean floor? Lido yelled. Isabel couldn't help looking up as she pulled her mother out of the water. It's getting closer, Isabel cried. The tinker was still hundreds of meters away, but it was so huge it felt like it was on top of them. They were never getting out of its way. Isabel's heart thumped so hard she thought it was going to burst right out of her chest. If we don't want them to know we're here, maybe we shouldn't, shouldn't start the engine, Amara yelled. They'll never hear us, no matter what we do, Senor Castillo said. The tanker was so loud now, it sounded like a jet engine. He and Luis flipped a switch on their own engine and yanked the starter chain again. A puff of gray smoke poofed out from the engine, but it didn't catch. The tanker loomed larger, closer. Isabel cringed. It was going to hit them. Luis yanked on the chain, a cough, a sputter, nothing. Cough, sputter, nothing. Cough, sputter, nothing. The sea swelled in front of the tanker, pushing them higher and away, and for a fleeting moment, Isabel's hopes rose with it. But then the swell passed, and they were pulled back in by the tanker's massive draw. Their little blue boat spun sideways, and they zoomed toward the big ship's prow. The tanker was going to tear them in half right down the middle. Isabel looked up into the terrified eyes of Ivan as he realized the same thing, and they screamed. Then suddenly, they were both thrown to the bottom of the boat, and something buzzed like a mosquito underneath, the howl of the tanker. Luis had gotten the engine to start. Their little boat shot forward in the water, darting out of the way of the tanker's prow, but the waves thrown off by the big ship lifted up the back end of Isabel's boat and dumped an ocean of seawater on top of them. Isabel swallowed a mouthful of salty water and tumbled across the boat. She slammed into something hard, and her shoulder exploded with pain. She came up spluttering. She was hip deep in water, and the engine had stopped again, but none of that mattered right now. Ivan's father had fallen overboard. 
Isabel saw his white-haired head rise up out of the water. Senor Castillo gulped for air, then disappeared as a wave from the massive tanker's wake rolled over him. Senor Castillo! Isabel cried. Papa! Ivan shouted. Where is he? Do you see him? Isabel and Ivan frantically searched the dark water, watching for Senor Castillo to surface again. They had missed the huge ship's prow by mere meters, but the waves the bay moth created as it passed were just as dangerous. The ocean heaved and sank, the little boat tipping over sideways as the waves caught it amidships. Everyone was just getting back up from the floor of the boat when they were sent tumbling again. Ivan rolled to the other side of the boat, but Isabel hung on. There! She saw Senor Castillo's head pop up from under the water, but only for a gasping second, too quick to get enough air. In a flash, Isabel remembered her grandmother disappearing under the waves, just like that two years ago. And without another thought, Isabel dove in after Senor Castillo. Mahmoud, Turkey, 2015, 11 days from home. Mahmoud screamed. He howled louder than a fighter jet, and his parents didn't even tell him to hush. Lights came on in houses nearby, and curtains ruffled as people looked out at the noise. Mahmoud's mother broke down in tears, and his father let the life jackets he carried drop to the ground. The smuggler just told them their boat wasn't leaving tonight. Again. No boat today. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, he told Mahmoud's father. It was exactly the same thing he told Mahmoud's father the day before, and the day before that, and every day for the last week. A text would come telling them to hurry, hurry, out to the beach, and every time they would pack up what few things they owned, grab the life jackets, and rush through the streets of Izmir to this parking lot, and every time there would be no boat waiting for them. First, it was the weather, the smuggler said. Then, another family that was supposed to go with them hadn't arrived yet. Then, it was the Turkish Coast Guard patrols, or the boat wasn't ready. There was always some reason they couldn't leave. It was like some cruel schoolyard game of keep away. Mahmoud and his family were at their wit's end. This off and on again business was tearing them apart, all except for Walid, lifeless Walid who didn't flinch when the bombs exploded. I want to go back to Syria. I don't care if we die, Mahmoud said after he'd let out his scream. I just want to get out of here. Even as he said it, he heard the whine in his voice, the pathetic, toddler-like frustration. Part of him was embarrassed. He was older than that, more mature. He was almost a man. But another part of him just wanted to stomp his feet and pitch a fit. And that part of him was getting harder and harder to keep quiet. Little Hana started crying too, and Mahmoud's mother tried to calm them both by pulling Mahmoud into a hug. Look at it this way, Dad said. Now we have more time to practice our Turkish. No one laughed. Let's get back to the mall before someone takes our place, Mom said wearily. Mahmoud carried the life jacket so his father could carry Walid who quickly fell asleep on his father's shoulder. His mother carried Hana, even though Mahmoud hated the desperate feeling of defeat in going back to the mall. At least it meant not sleeping outside in the park. But this time, someone was waiting for them at the mall entrance. There were two of them, both Turkish men, in matching blue tracksuits. One of them was muscular, with curly black hair, a thin beard, and a thick gold chain necklace. The other was overweight and wore mirrored sunglasses, even though it was night. He was the one with the pistol stuck in the waist of his pants. You want to wait outside? You gotta pay rent, the burly man told them. Since when? Mahmoud's father said. Since now, the man said. We own this building and we're tired of you Syrians freeloading. More bullies, thought Mahmoud just like in Syria. Mahmoud's legs went numb, and he thought he might fall over. He couldn't bear the thought of walking any further, looking for a place to live again. 
How much? Mahmoud's father asked wearily. Five thousand pounds a night. The muscular man, Dad's, um, muscular man said. Dad sighed and started to put Walid down so he could pay the man. Each, the man said. Each per night. Dad said. Mahmoud knew his dad was go doing the math in his head. There were five of them, and they'd already been there for a week. How long? Could they afford to pay 25,000 pounds a day and still have enough for the boat and whatever came afterward? No, Mahmoud's father said. Mom started to protest, but he shook his head. No, we already have all our things. We'll find some place else to stay. It's only until tomorrow. The big man chuck chuckled. Right, tomorrow. <laughs> Mahmoud staggered along behind his parents as they roamed the streets of Ismir looking for some place to sleep. His parents carried Walid and Hana, but not him. He was too old to be carried any more, and for the first time, he wished he wasn't. They finally found the doorway of a travel agency set back from the street, and no one else was sleeping there. They were just settling in when a Turkish police car came down the street. Mahmoud shrank, shrank back into the corner, trying to be invisible, but the police car's lights came on and it beeped its electronic siren at them. Boop, boop. You can't sleep here, a police officer told them through a loudspeaker, and so they had to get up and walk again. Mahmoud was so tired, he started to cry, but, it, but he did it softly so his parents wouldn't hear. He hadn't cried like this since that first night when the bombs had started to fall on Aleppo. Another car came down the road, and at first Mahmoud worried it was another police car, but it was a BMW sedan. On a whim, Mahmoud darted out into the car's headlights and waved the life jackets on his arms. Mahmoud, no! His mother cried. The BMW slowed, its lights bright in his face. The driver honked at him, and Mahmoud hurried around to the driver's side window. Please, can you help us? Mahmoud begged. My baby sister but the car was already shooting away. Another car followed it, and it drove right past Mahmoud. Mahmoud, get out of the street, his father called. You'll get yourself killed. Mahmoud didn't care anymore. There had to be someone who would help them. He waved the life jackets at the next car, and miraculously it stopped. It was an old brown Skoda, and the driver rolled the window down by hand. He was an elderly, wrinkled man with a short white beard, and he wore a black and white kifia headscarf. Please, can you help us? Mahmoud asked. My family and I have nowhere to go. Only a baby. Dad jogged up and tried to pull Mahmoud away. We're very sorry, Mahmoud's father told the man. We didn't mean to bother you. We'll be on our way. Mahmoud was annoyed. He'd finally gotten somebody to stop, and now his father was trying to send him away? My house is too small for you, the man said, but I have a little car dealership, and you can stay in the office. Arabic! Mahmoud was thrilled. The man spoke fluent Arabic. No, no, we couldn't possibly, Mahmoud's father started to say, but Mahmoud cut him off. Yes, thank you, Mahmoud cried. He waved his mother over. He speaks Arabic, and he says he will help us. Dad tried to apologize again and refuse the offer of help, but Mahmoud was already climbing <clears throat> in the back seat with a load of life jackets. Mom got in beside him with Hana, and Mahmoud's father shifted Walid in his arms so he could reluctantly sit in front passenger seat. Mahmoud, his father said unhappy, but Mahmoud didn't care. They were off their feet, and they were on their way to some place they could sleep. The little Sokoda's gears ground as the man got them underway. My name is Samil Nasir, the man told them, and Mahmoud's father introduced them all. You are a Syrian, yes, refugees? The man asked. I know what it's like. I'm a refugee too, from Palestine. Mahmoud frowned. This man was a refugee, and he owned his own car and his own business.